Hi, Zoe. Hi, Joanne. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. But somebody's been telling me you're learning fortune telling. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. I haven't really decided on where my forte is yet. So I've been trying a few different techniques. Do you want to see how it goes? Yeah. Predicting yeah, what's happening for property litigation? Absolutely. Excellent. So the first technique I'm trying is that of the fortune cookie. We all love the fortunes we get in our fortune cookie. And I've got one here and it says, we shape our buildings and afterwards they shape us. Which I thought was quite a sophisticated fortune cookie there. And it just, it got me thinking, building shaping us. Alexander Devine, building in breach of covenant, it not only shapes our physical future, but for them, it shaped their litigation future as well. Yeah. So that's Martin Hutchins and James McCrest's case, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. Uh, and am I right? They, they've had their Supreme Court hearing, but we haven't had the judgments yet. I think that's right. Yes. Yeah. That's such an interesting one about, uh, you know, modification of restrictive covenants and the balance between public interest and private property rights, isn't it? It is, because in that case, though, one of the points that was argued, as I understand it, is that because they had planning permission, obviously, development was in the public interest. Pretty controversial way of looking at the public interest and that interaction between uh, private and, and public rights. Yeah, and I think such interesting questions also about who gets to decide. Is it the first, um, the, the first instance court or tribunal? Is it the Court of Appeal? And where, where is the balance there in relation to exercise of the discretion? Yeah, so it'd be interesting to see how they did. Yeah, absolutely. What's your next technique then, Zoe? Well, I also have a brilliant crystal ball, which you have to give it a bit of a shake to get up and going, but can you see that? There yeah, we go. Brilliant. And then just as it settles, <laughs> you have to see what you can see. Now it's a bit murky, but when it's murky like that, I always think fraud. It's got to be fraud. Um, there's always a bit of fraud in property litigation. And I think that must be a reference to the um, professional negligence decision in the mortgage fraud case of Stoffel and Grandona. Mm, yeah, absolutely fascinating, this one. And it's got such wide ramifications, hasn't it? So that's the one, isn't it, where um, the lady, Mrs. Grandona, had brought, bought property and she was actually part of a mortgage fraud. She was. But the solicitors who acted for her were in, were indeed negligent and they hadn't properly registered her, her interest or, or that of her mortgagee. It, that's exactly right. They didn't register the, the, the TR1 and um, discharge the existing DS1 from recollection. Um, but the point was that they didn't know about the mortgage fraud. And so... Um, that's not been of any assistance to them yet in escaping liability for their professional negligence. Yeah, yeah, very interesting appeal given the Patel and Mirza angle and how that will play out in the context of property rights. Yeah, and it's the, the, the reason it went to the Court of Appeal at all, I think, is because of the Patel and Mirza decision was handed down after the High Court judgment. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how the Supreme Court treat this. Yeah, really interesting. What's next then, Zoe? Well, you very kindly earlier today sent me uh, a very COVID safe scan of your hand for me to try and divine your future. Um, and I've been having a good look at it. And I can see that you're going to be very prosperous and that there's a tall, dark gentleman in your future, as always needs to be the case. I'll tell my but, husband. Fascinatingly, I could also make out the numbers 1954. <laughs> now, everyone associates you um, with amazing litigation in respect to the 1954 Act, obviously after Francis yeah, going to the Supreme Court, there isn't more 1954 Act litigation of, of a similarly exciting level, is there, Joanne? There certainly is, yeah. I'm, I'm leading Mark Galtry on, on a really interesting case, TFS and the designer retail outlet, which is going to the Court of Appeal next spring, date still to be fixed, and that's about the process of contracting out from the 1954 Act and exactly what the tenant has to put into their declaration um, as part of the contracting out process. So this is the declaration that they respond to the warning notice with to say they know they're not going to, to, to get the various rights of, of protection under the 54 Act. Yeah, that's right. So there's a little part of the form that says um, I'm taking a lease for a term commencing on. And the question is, what has to go in there? Um, so all up for grabs, really. And sometimes, presumably, it's easier to know 
when the date of the commencement of the term is going to be than in, on other occasions, I suppose. You might have an agreement for lease where you've got to fit out, et cetera, or do various works before you get your lease. Is that why it's been problematic? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the judge below held that all the various forms of words that had been used on the six leases in that case were all um, either correct or it's in a substantially similar form, but we'll be challenging that and uh, watch this space. And the ramifications will be enormous, presumably, because lots of, if you're successful, because lots of people will end up with protection that they thought they didn't otherwise have. Yeah, potentially right, that's right. Excellent, well, best of luck with that. Um, another technique that I've been trying is a bit of reading of the old tea leaves. Um, and I've got some rather lovely Fortnum and Mason tea that um, I've been using for this. I'm not sure if the brand matters, but again, quite murky and hard to read. And, and I was struggling at first to think of other frauds and then, or naughtiness at least, but then of course came to mind business rates avoidance, which has been various schemes of which have been perennially popular over the last few years. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's a, a really important um, decision for local authorities who are obviously somewhat cash strapped at the moment. Um, now, what that's, that's a decision in Rossendale, I think, isn't it? That's right. And it's coming up and it's going to be heard in the Supreme Court next week, actually, 26th of October. So really, really topical. And I'm sure there'll be lots of local authorities waiting to hear what, what the answer will be. Yeah, now there's two, there's two, I think, key strands to um, that decision. One is a kind of a, a, a pressed Petrodell type piercing the corporate veil um, strand, isn't it? And the other is to do with wider sort of tax case principles about avoidance. Um, I think in respect to the last, yeah. I was going to say, I think, it's, I think what happened was that the defendants were in occupation and would have been liable for non-domestic rates but they granted leases to SPVs and then wound up the SPVs. And the Court of Appeal held, well, it was the SPVs that had the liability for rates. And so the councils couldn't come against the defendants. And that's obviously got a lot of interesting ramifications for other property transactions. SPVs are very commonly used, aren't they? In lots and lots of different yeah. in the property world. So um, if, if the councils can get round that structure in this case, be interesting to see where else that might occur as, as well. Absolutely. Um, the last technique that I wanted to try and deploy isn't so much one of my own as uh, to, to borrow in the special skills of Paul the Octopus, if you remember him. <laughs> um, now, Paul was very, very successful in predicting the future, um, but unfortunately we haven't been able to get him into chambers. Um, but I did, when I was doing a little bit of research, come across the most amazing video of Paul the Octopus sticking his little arm out and answering a phone, which was brilliant. And I thought, telecommunications. <laughs> um, it looks like Cornerstone are continuing to be at the vanguard of um, the true extent of the new code and the rights that they have as operators um, under it. Mm -hmm. um, there's a couple of decisions, I think, coming up, aren't there? Yeah, that's right. So I think um, there's permission to appeal, which has been granted for an appeal to the Supreme Court in the Cornerstone and Compton Beecham case. And our very own Jonathan Seatler is also on his way to the Court of Appeal in the um, Cornerstone and Ashlock case as well. So plenty of activity on the telecoms front. Yeah. And they raise uh, points about the, the extent of the new code rights, which hasn't always lived up to the expectations that operators had of it being this whole new regime that was going to be rather more sort of commercially friendly um, than, the, than the old regime. Um, and in particular, it seems to be taking longer to get the benefits of the new code for operators than they had originally envisaged. So some of these decisions are, are, are quite controversial. Mm. Uh, it'd be interesting to see how they pan out. And of course the Ashlock decision is also interesting with its interaction with the 1954 Act. Mm. Um, yeah, watch this space. Well, I think we've got a very interesting time um, ahead of us with some really great property cases coming our way over the next year or so. What are you up to this afternoon, Zoe? Well, I'm definitely going to keep trying to predict the future. <laughs> Sounds good. Lovely to speak to you and catch up soon. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.